that you had a good decom up to now, that you will learn a lot of things that are relevant to you in the jobs that you're having and in, in the work that you're doing. And in the next 45 minutes, what I will actually try to bring across to you is how big an innovation we're actually having at our hands with S4. So what really the game-changing nature of the whole story is and how we are leveraging that to really bring innovation to customers. Um, there's one more important point about it which is, if you bring that innovation, how can a customer actually adopt it? What does it mean to go to S4 HANA? Is it a feasible roadmap, or is it a very complicated one? And that will be the second big topic that I will talk about, that we actually manage to bring that innovation to a customer system in a way that it can be adopted. And with that, I would really start diving into uh, the presentation. Um, and everything needs to have a purpose. Right. We're not doing these things just to provide technology or do something new that has uh, no meaning, it has a purpose. And the purpose is that we want to keep customers in their systems and landscapes innovating. And today, a lot of the money that customers are spending is actually just spent to keep the lights on. Systems have become very complicated, data is replicated many, many times in your systems. Um, there is then uh, consulting companies that try to find values that describe of how much of the complexity uh, is actually uh, consuming the cost uh, and how this is actually hindering innovation. And this is the status today, right, in the landscapes you're, you're pretty much uh, tends to, to continue in this innovation. But the problem is getting bigger, right? The data volumes on these planets are increasing and this is a pr prediction that by 2020 we will have uh, 44 set uh, set on this planet and every customer has his share of data that he needs to use in the business processes. And how can you do that, right? The problem is actually exploding from where we are at. And then you're all chartered to come up with your big data strategies, bring in mobile, go in the direction of networks and um, use some cloud somewhere. So imagine all this to achieve that in the complexity that you have today, which is already a challenge, but even more, it's uh, uh, increasing over time going to the future. Now, Sweden HANA was the starting point. This is what we set up with, and the customers that are coming along with us on this journey by far, um, they are now actually learning uh, what it means to become in memory, and in memory is really a very new technology, so we are all learning again. If you learn, what it means is you run through a maturity curve. There's the initial step, and then over time you get more and more expert, and in the end you're kind of savvy. So the first level was better speed, right? We talked about that, that was the initial announcement, how nice, super fast, and so on, which it is, but this is just a starting point. Speed is a technical quality, and you need to purpose speed such that it has a value, right? And it gets a value if you have better planning runs, if you can start simulating things, um, also, if you have a, a more real-time aspect to your pro business, that's already a very good self. But then the, the next step was better insights, better decisions. And what, what's behind that statement is that with HANA, we have a very fast analytical um, engine, and so we can recombine transactional and analytical processes in one system. You know, in the traditional model, we always had offloaded analytical things to the BW, and then you had a latency like one day later, you always reported on yesterday's problem only. But with HANA, you can combine that. And all of a sudden, you can change your decisions before your decisions affect uh, the physical world. And that drives a, a dramatic improvement in the way that you use operational reporting to manage your system. And then comes the next level, which is in essence the business process. And it has to be said that a business process design is always as good as the architecture that you have in place, right? And now, what, what, what do I mean there, right? Today, you have a lot of business process that start with a data preparation phase, then you do the business process, and because there is an elapsed time, you then have uh, reconciliation work and exception management that is a derivative of that. And this is, if you wish, the blueprint of business process design that comes out of the 90s 
when the big business process re-engineering phases were, 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 were there. So that was the blueprint of, of, of a lot of business process designs. And customer systems that have been implemented in the 90s or early 2000s, and then normally they just took technical upgrades, they kind of still have the terror time intrinsically. So on the one hand side, we can improve the business process as you know it, but then there are all these new business processes, right? Internet of Things is coming. That changes the business processes, and they are data heavy. You go to the end customer instead of through a wholesaler, change of business process. You go via the internet, change of business processes. And a lot of these changes are dependency on how you use the data, right? If you want to automate and so on. So the business process is really under investigation, uh, under change, not investigation, under uh, heavy uh, change. And uh, one of my favorite examples, actually a very minor one, um, there is people whose actual job is that they prepare data. So they are in essence data clerks because the system was never responsive enough for other people to immediately get the results. Any of these tasks were just performance workarounds, right? So business process design today can get beyond that and by that get a new level of efficiency. And then up to that level, this is what SAP will productize, right? And then customers are actually using that to get to better products and better business models. And those are things that are driven of, of, um, of uh, the, the data availability. A nice example here is Kesa Compressor. It's a German company, and their traditional business is they're selling compressor, compressors. Right? And they change actually in the direction of, of selling compressed air, which means they take their compressors, put it to a customer, and they still own it. And because they use Internet of Things, they get uh, information from their sensors, based on the qualities, they know when to maintain those compressors, and so they do preventive maintenance, so they go there and fix it before it breaks, right? And that means that they can ensure uptime of these compressors, and by that sell compressed air. Complete business model change, and it's heavy on data because you have the streaming information from IoT, you automatically predict uh, the behavior in there, and then you trigger maintenance work. So it hits in the end the back end, but then you need uh, the performance that, that does that. Now we have a significant amount of customers who are following with us, so the market adoption of Sweden HANA is great. We have today more than 300 productive systems. Actually we have almost a, a go live a day at the moment, and that number will increase. We have more than uh, 330 projects that are implementing, and these are just the ones that we know, right? Because we are GA since like 18 months, and that means we don't know all the projects. This is really just the ones where we can give you the name in, in essence, where we work with, where we know how the projects are running, and where we are getting involved. And the systems that are in the move, they are of each size. Yeah? The biggest one has 165,000 users. So it's massive systems. It's not just proof of concept or stuff. It, it, it's, it, it's really happening. We have customers who are by now implementing their fourth, fifth, sixth system. Yeah? That also tells you something, because the first system you do based on the promise you perceive or on, on the understanding. The second you do based on the experience you have. right? So continuing the rollout in your landscape is for us a significant proof point for the viability of the whole story. So why didn't we just continue the Sweden HANA story, right? That was uh, the way we've done it. And that you can see here on, 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 the, on the right upper hand side, which is we kind of hit a wall because we at SAP, we are ourselves learning what this technology can do for us, right? So we started with speed and insights and so on, we do the, the process moves. And Till the enhancing package 7, our code line was always still database agnostic. So we said, HANA is technically, first of all, just another database. It runs underneath our application. And we sometimes say, if HANA, do it this way. If not, HANA, do it the other way. But it was kind of very equal in terms of capabilities. HANA was faster. We had a few things that were only possible then. But we kept one code line stable. But with what we learned is we can do even more dramatic things with HANA, and then we said, why would we limit our capacity to innovate? We wanted to harvest that innovation at hand to really make uh, the best use of this technology, and we are at the moment defining that, right? The traditional model would be by database agnostic. That meant SAP could always only adopt a database capability when the last database supplied the very capability because we're the database agnostic. At the moment, we shape a future. We define what it means to write application against the memory technology. And so this is where we decided, well, if you want to go there, 
then we need to be uh, uh, no longer database agnostic. And that is this topic about uh, this S-curve model down there. We really can get to significantly higher value. So this is the promise of that. And I will now walk you through why S4HANA is different, what are the key elements that are different compared to the traditional goal, and how we actually create value. And I think there is a few things in there that are really interesting. So it's, it's, I think some of those things are really dramatic. The three key pillars of that transformative move that we do with S4 are on the one hand side a simplified data model. I'll walk you through that. We go for Fiori because if we would not address the user experience in the next generation, I think SAP would jump short. We would not fulfill on uh, another area. And then we also change the way of how you configure our system. Right? So we simplify there as well. So let's start with the simplified data model. What you see here, it's a little bit of a complicated slide, um, but the essence of that statement is actually we are changing the data model design that we have. You know, in the traditional world, data models were always normalized. The moment you see something, you, you imagine which tables would you use, and then you separate things out, and then you start in your queries to join these tables whenever you need them. That is the traditional world. It's because uh, a relational database, they don't compress data so very well, and you're also <laughs> confined in performance. Now, HANA is a columnar database. Columnar means if a column is empty, it's compressed to zero almost. Right? So you actually can aff afford to have a data model that has some redundancies in there. And so what you're doing is you're coll collapsing quite a number of database tables into one, the new ArcDoc R table in financials, for example. And that means that for all the accesses to the table, you no longer need to join, which makes your data access super fast each time you want to use that information. And the compression of the columnar allows us that. This is dramatic change in data model design. You wouldn't ever do that in a traditional world, right? And again, we, we collapse a lot of tables. We, traditionally, we had a financials and a controlling document, which by 95% had equal information. We collapse that in one. We don't store it twice. Reconciliation goes out. Because we do that, we can do multi-dimensional reporting in the system without a BW. Again, another simplification. And then if you still have a BW, because there are other reasons, then it's just one extractor. It's not 20 extractors, it's one only. Again, simplification. So such a data model change is dramatic to the things we can do and how it opens up for business processes. Second big step, and I think that was discussed more often already, is we throw out aggregates and indices. And just to so get a visual expression, this is what's happening. We are throwing out many tables. And these tables, they actually own two thirds of the data, right? So all of a sudden, our data footprint goes down from something like um, a terabyte down to uh, 300 gig. So that's dramatic. That's simplifying your world. Even more important, these aggregates and indices, what they are doing is they are restricting the, the throughput in the system. Right? Because what you do is, if you post data, you always ensure that the data is updated only from one place, so only one user or one interface at a time can do that. And then the aggregates they may basically interconnect individual postings. So there's two types of, of logging. Two people working on the very same object, that is rare, right? That is not so often. But two people working on the same aggregate, that is more often. So it's the same account that has been posted from two people, and they have to wait on each other in the system. So those things, they limit the throughput. And in financials, that is maybe not so important, but in logistics it is. Because there is so much business process change ongoing, that will increase uh, the throughput requirements in your system. Right? And then the second thing is we obviously have replaced the, 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 the now traditional BSEC with the new actor A, which is then this combined document, and that then really makes up the uh, model change. The other topic that we actually gained with that is that we create flexibility in analysis. Right? What, what is behind this is that we can on the fly calculate these aggregates, though that means also for a simulated version of an org structure or a product hierarchy, we can calculate on the fly. So we improved dramatically the way that we can simulate in the system. Right? Now talking through that, that sounds like, you know, if all the data model changes, all the code's gone, right? What happens to the code? Um, is everything new then? Because how can you work with your traditional code uh, against this completely new data model, which is kind of disruptive the way it looks like? 
But there are our friends from the Diva, they actually came up with a great idea. And they used, uh, or they gave us a HANA capability and we call them compatibility fuse. What these compatibility fuse actually do for us, they mimic the old data model. So if you see on the left hand side, traditionally we had a program that went against an aggregate and it just read it. Right? So it was a quick reading. What the fuse are doing, they go against the head and item tables and on the fly calculate the very same value and export that result to the program. So for a program that does reading against these structures, it is tr transparent, it is irrelevant whether it's just been fetched or whether it's calculated. You get the same information and so the program continues to run. And that is true for our own code at SAP, that is true for partner code and that is true for customer code. So what now happens is, is that you have actually found a way of coming from the traditional world, the Enhancement Package 7, into S4. We take the majority of code with us. Things can run as before. It's a technical move. And then you start adopting the new things. Because where we do really new things, and I talk about Fiori and those things in a moment, there obviously you have to follow what we're doing, right? So some changes are there, but it's always a mix and match, right? You don't want no innovation, this is why we do the whole story, but you want to be able to consume the innovation. And with this technology, this is how they actually found a way to bridge you into this future. And that is really a, a dramatic, uh, I use that word too often, I think, an important <laughs> a step to actually get into this uh, uh, new world that there's a migratability that, that we get behind that. And then, we use that for business process innovation, right? And the list is just there, to, so we can close the periods faster, we can do forecasting, better service levels. So we then can really use that and improve the business scenarios in many areas. And it, it has to be said that customers very often use simple finance in a POC and show that to their lines of businesses, right? Um, and those business users, they are getting really enthusiastic because reconciliation is gone and uh, many, many works are simplified. And that, that really sells them on, on moving into this direction. So if you can do a POC with your own data to your users, that, that really changes their aspects. Because if you would only tell them, it's kind of, you know, you can't touch it, you cannot feel it. And the people, it's difficult um, uh, to imagine a new world, right? And in, in particular, if it is so different than, than before. So in that sense, these POCs, they really help the customers to show that. Yeah. Now, I talked about the key data changes. Yeah? And by the way, we do that now in logistics, so we continue to do that in, in the business suite. So over time, we will have that at large. Um, but what does it actually do to your landscape? Right. Reducing the data footprint is nice in one system. That's in itself OK. But it has a, a, a great effect on your landscape. So the, the, the numbers you're seeing here are from SAP's own system. We came from a highly compressed <laughs> database on 7.1 terabyte. Going to Sweden HANA, because of the normal compression, brought us down to 1.8 terabyte. Applying simple finance and the simplification brought us down to 0.8 terabyte. Now this means that in your network, you're no longer replicating 7 terabyte out. You're only replicating 0.8 terabyte out. Right? Your storage, you're no longer storing 7.1 terabyte. If you create HA and DR scenarios, the startup times are much faster. So that means you maybe have a low-cost way of doing HA and DR, depending always on where you're at and what your service levels will be. But that is a dramatic effect in your landscape, right? And we will further increase the footprint. So we have plans of how we can get that even down to maybe 0 0.5. And then throughput, I talked about it. It's particularly important in logistics, also in financials in all areas. And then flexibility in reporting. And where I say we can on the fly calculate these things. Now we're not start stopping there. This is just the uh, data model aspects, right? And this kind of changes with the new non normalized uh, data model and uh, the uh, deletion of aggregates, we can only do in this technology. But then we also focus on the end user. So this is why we do Fiori. I expect that Fiori was a topic here as well. It's, I think, everywhere. It's a new UI paradigm. And uh, while it serves uh, a purpose of being intuitive uh, for non-frequent users, it does a few more things for us. It's the first UI technology where we completely separate out the UI layer from the application <coughs> layer. And that means finally we have APIs that you as a customer can come up with your own uh, front ends instead of using batch inputs, which you traditionally did, right? Because we always had this little bit intermingled 
between uh, uh, many cases, and batch input was never a real UI interface. It was okay, but architecture-wise, there was limits to what you can do, and now with all that innovation, think about um, Google Glass with speech recognition. I think it's a great combination for our user interface, and we will have the services available based on what we're doing. So all the new business processes, all the new scenarios we're doing will be flooring. But then we also have a, a program that takes existing UIs and replaces them or find a replacement which is a Fiori UI. And then there are key elements of how we do that. As I said, we are combining <laughs> transactional and analytical processing, which means we can include simulation in the UIs, we can have decision support via prediction algorithms, the system will know and will be able to suggest uh, the way that you behave, and these are screenshots uh, coming from an MMP planner app that we have done. We have also other apps. So these are really valuable to look into. It, it really changes how you interact with the system because you no longer have separate places where you go and find data until you hit a transaction. We can give you a flow. We have it, a combined intuitive uh, experience. And then, as Fiori is an HTML5 uh, technology that runs in browsers, anything is becoming mobile. Right? And I know that not for each customer everything is a mobile something, but each customer has his own area where he wants to be mobile. So for us at SAP, it means we have to be mobile everywhere, right? Because if we, we won't make the choices then this is uh, bound to be mobile enabled, this not or so. So this technology opens up to be mobile everywhere. And this is also why we don't focus anymore on a mobile story in itself. We are mobile by, by default when we go into this story. Now, configuration is the other big topic that, that we start innovating. And you know, traditionally, we have the customizing tables, and um, they are kind of rich. You can do anything in there. Not, not, not uh, for no reason we uh, run our applications across the globe in all industries. But the way you configure was many small individual decisions, while actually some decisions drive a lot of sub-dependent entries in these tables. And so what we're doing, we're le elevating the configuration from having all those small decisions up to a higher level. And if you, for example, decide that a plant is going to be in the US, it will mean that the currency will be dollar and uh, the tax uh, settings are like this. So you have then a combined uh, defaulting of these subsequent small things. And that will make implementation a much easier job going forward. Now. Quite dramatic innovation, right, on all angles. It's uh, the data footprint, it's the processes, it's the UI level, it's also the uh, uh, configuration. Now, what does that mean if you, as a customer, want to go there? And on the left-hand side, this picture starts uh, with a ERP system or CRM, what have you, uh, on any database. Um, and the first step will always be sweet on HANA, right? The whole solution must run on HANA because without that we cannot apply the data model changes in the things. Now moving to Sweden HANA, for those customers who come along with us, 75% um, of all the customers who are doing the upgrade finish <laughs> that within six months, and that means the project duration is very comparable to customers only doing an enhancement package upgrade. Almost all customers combining them, I know very few customers who, who first do an enhancement package upgrade and as a second step would do a database migration. It's owed to the fact that in both cases, one of the biggest efforts is testing, and people try to combine it. Testing is not a fun work for your business users to do. Um, and technically, it, it's very simple. So the, the things that you do with, with your customer code is supported by the code inspector. It, it helps you do those things very efficiently. It's not a major effort. And then the second step is actually bringing in um, the simplifications, right? Uh, so simple finance is the first of these. It's, just starting to be available in uh, the version 2.0. And the way that is done is we provide those things in what we call simplification packages. Simplification packages is a way of, in a system, you just replace that piece that is getting simplified. So you can think of it as a enhancing package kind of work just for the financials piece. So if you bring in simple finance, your logistics will be untouched, your quality management, your production will be untouched, and what you have to do kind of feels like an enhancing package for the financial piece if you do the first step only technical. And for SAP, when we've done that, 
this project took us 55 days, so close to two months. So again, a very feasible technical step. And then obviously we'll start to use then all the innovation. If you just do the technical step, then because the data model has changed, you already have less reconciliation, you have a soft close of your books at all times. So even with the technical step, you already get significant value, and then the big value is by adopting the new theories and the new process that, that we're doing. But what we have achieved here is actually, we make it a digestible project. It's very feasible to get there. And then we also say that actually S4HANA is available in three deployment options. We have the <coughs> on-premise version, uh, and we have a public cloud version, and in the middle we have a private managed cloud version. And how do they differentiate, right? Um, on-premise, very much a full ERP. A lot of things are simplified, not everything where we not have simplified at the moment, we have the old code as it was, and over time we will simplify it. So very broad ERP as you know it today. Public cloud, different story. Um, we actually have a very narrow scope. We started off with um, what we call the scope of uh, professional services, uh, project business, selling projects and the like. And we also have some marketing scenarios from Hybris and so on that, that are part of this story. Um, and the reason being is that here we have a full Fiori coverage and we are kind of having a, a targeted go-to-market on this application. So over time, this will be growing in capabilities. And then we said we also need something that is brought in capabilities from the get-go, right? And in terms of uh, 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 sequencing of work or so, uh, we could not have like the full scope enabled in totally cloud-ready ways. So we have the managed cloud where we expose a significant amount of capabilities along with uh, the scope of the public cloud. And you can imagine that this is um, uh, what we said is the business all-in-one foundational scope. What is that? The business all-in-one foundational scope is, let, let me say, uh, the most commonly used pieces of, um, of, of the SAP ERP. When we built the business all in one, we basically had an assessment of what is running um, uh, at our customers in, in productive use. And we kind of then had a pre-configured version of the ERP with this most commonly used capabilities. And so this is then the scope that you have the private managed cloud. So it's a very broad uh, uh, capability already. And now what's different, right? The difference is that in the private managed cloud, you will have to apply also those rules of engagement out of the cloud. And one key characteristic is the extensibility. In the cloud, you're bound to use very much a standard, while on premise, you can do a system whatever you want. Right? Most of you will have modified our systems in one place or the other. So you're doing things that are actually uh, making those systems unique. Now, this is not a cloud model. A cloud model is about automation of life cycle and so on. So this is why we have a different set of rules of engagement of what you are allowed to do to the system. But what you then gain is that this system really upgrades easily. So it can follow the innovation stream. And then you do that where you actually don't have to modify. So it's, it's a, a different paradigm. And if you need really your system to be heavily modified and extended up to your needs, then there is on-premise or a traditional hosting model. This does not mean we don't have a uh, extension concept because we actually have a three-level extension concept to the solution. On the one hand side, there is HCP, HANA Cloud Platform, to come up with bolt-ons, with developments that are larger in scope, where you really can do some own big uh, uh, programs. On the other hand side, we still have uh, uh, ABAP, but we don't give you the full ABAP capabilities. It's a reduced subset. It's that subset that actually we can control in the bodies that we can upgrade, so that we keep the upgradability of the system alive. And then there is this other thing in the Fioris. We are actually at the moment building a tool that will allow adding fields to a Fiori app and being able to add a, a table to the Fiori app. And that is then kind of a, a tool-based equipment. It's a forward-looking statement at this point because we've, we've, we've not yet delivered it. But that is in the labs of AM. And with that, we really have also in the managed cloud and in the public cloud an extension concept that it really helps you get that system to what it needs to be for you. Right. So that kind of brings me close to the end, actually. Um, 
And I hope I could show you that with what we're doing, we really rejuvenating uh, the ERP. We, we, with, with the changes we're doing, I think we are uniquely positioned um, to innovate the interaction of people with the system and also to prepare actually um, systems for the next future, right? And the next future is all about how can I create value out of all the data that is collected. Yeah? Today, customers are collecting data. It's very much lying around. It's not value adding. It's more or less a cost to keep the light out, but it's very difficult to bring that into context of end users, to use prediction algorithms, use the search engine, these kind of things. They are all super complicated in a traditional world. HANA has those things attached to the database, so we can make use of that, and by that change the interaction paradigms of our end user. And so that said, we will have a different level of, of, of uh, information in the system, so decisions will improve. The business process will get really simpler. They will bring information um, instantly to those who need it without uh, people uh, playing around, playing the middleman, uh, and uh, by that, uh, the efficiency will strongly change. I can give you one example there from one of our customers who actually is running a process, um, uh, which is they sell a high uh, value product, and based on uh, uh, their, their customers, they add specific equipment to this uh, uh, to this um, uh, uh, to this product. So. And we call that uh, engineering change request. So they manufacture components to it and so on. So each time a customer asks for, for, a, for a change, for an, for an uh, added component, they, they run this engineering change request to come back with a price, right? What does it cost me to do this change? And this process from the request until the uh, offer, um, with these process changes possible, they could reduce that by 40%. And a reduction of 40% means this is no time where the customer goes to competition. It's also not a time where you sometimes have to fast come back with an offer and you basically then bet on, on a value that you give and it's either too expensive and then the customer may leave you or it's too cheap and you, you don't make your money with it. So being fast in, in such a process is game changing for your customer experience. And then it actually needs even to imagine business pro, uh, models as I just explained also with, with Casa Compressor. So I do think we, we really have a, a, a very interesting uh, innovation uh, at hand, which is accessible and achievable. And with that, I think I actually come to the end. I thank you for your attention, and I hope it was interesting to you. Thank you. We can do questions, obviously. No questions, really not. I mean, the question about competitors, right? I mean, we always have to be concerned about competitors, right? There's all this uh, economy out there. But really, uh, I think in terms of in-memory technology, we are leading edge. There is open source in-memory and so on. But you always have to imagine it has to run at enterprise scale with the support that you get in enterprise scale. And then HANA is not only an in-memory database, it is also a platform because we have a pattern recognition, we have a search engine, we have a text analysis, we do spatial analysis in there. And those are things that happen on the very data without replicating to a satellite system. So it's a combination of being a columnar, highly compressed uh, database with all these components. And at this point in time, there is no product out there that has these qualities as well. And then, we are leading the pack here. You know, when we started off with that, um, we were the, uh, the first on enterprise scale to offer that. At that point in time, 
uh, that, that large uh, database providers didn't have anything. They are trying to do catch up. But if you look into those things, you will see that it's not like ours an in-memory database that's just there. Uh, some of the offerings I know then, they are actually just indexing in memory, but they still have the data on disk. So they're basically duplicating it. And so for some reads, the indexing works, for others not. So at this point in time, I think we're leading the pack. Um, and with the definition we're doing on that layer, what, what does, what's happening in the ABAP stack, and what's happening in the application, and what's happening in the database, <coughs> we, we really define at the moment um, how is this development model? Yeah? What, what do you really expect from a database as compared to the technology stack in between, or what is the task of the application? And I don't see anyone who is doing that at the moment. Right? They're trying to play catch up on the database side, um, but no one's, as well as us, defining that, uh, that cadence of, uh, of all those layers. So, so that said, it's not so that we, we are the only one who could invent that, that right? But we are the only one this far, and I think we are leading the pack by quite a bit. So not that I say uh, in 10 years from now uh, we will be the only one, right? But we are shaping this well at the moment, and we are leading by quite some distance. Other questions? He translates again. That's fine. Okay. So thanks a lot. Oh, I have one. Oh, there's one more. Forget about this. So. Okay, let's say I do have a lot of custom code in one area that uh, will be replaced by innovation. Mm -hmm. So how, how, how will this be affected? You know, okay. How these transitions or migrations are yeah. So the question was, for <laughs> the people in the back, I repeated, I think, is, um, what happens if you have in one area a lot of custom code and then we come up with a uh, new something, right? So and then what, what happens to your custom code? Uh, so what we're doing is we're not like throwing out all the existing ABAP, right? So we provide, for example, new UI layers, but then we reuse as much code as we can. So what you will see happening is that you will have extended our UI most likely in places. That you would have then to do in the context of your. On the other hand side, you will have implemented some bodies, right? And many of those will be available and invoked out of another context. So there, a lot of things you will be able to take along with yourself. So it will be a mix. To apply then the new UIs, obviously, if you have done extended fields in the subgui, they will not be there in the Fiori. That, that's an, 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 an extra effort. But from your capabilities, uh, they will move along. And then, um, again, you can have uh, uh, enhancements in different ways. If you have nicely capsuled your enhancements, like build your own function modules that you invoke, then it's simple to migrate it over to another place. If you have littered that in many places, right, small pieces in the thousands of parties, not so easy, right? Then, then the, the flows are different. Um, so this is it's not one answer, right, mm -hmm. uh, that I can give. But I do think that over time the uh, development uh, structures have far gone into the direction of capsulating new things and trying to have, have things located. So these kind of well-architected things, I think they can be migrated easily. That, that's going to be a, a good experience. Other questions? Please. It's your chance. How about the industries? Ah, how about the industries? Uh, good one. Um, as you've seen, this, this changes. Um, we, uh, we, we have also an influence on the industry solutions. So first of all, there is a set of uh, industry solutions that are in the standard. They are coming along from the get-go. Chemicals, for example, and so on. Then there are some where uh, it's an add-on, and as always, they will have to adopt the model. And this is what we've always done. So we, we come up with this basis, we, we do this at the moment like for logistics, and then once that has kind of stabilized, we are finished with this step, and then the industries come on top of that and do their adoption. And we, we start that a little later because we don't want them to work on a, a system which is in, in the move, right? It's very complicated to work against the moving target. So we do that at, at the end. So this is then how the industries will move along. But that said, it doesn't mean that, um, that uh, uh, the S4 is not applicable to the industries, because not each system in the industries does have an industry at all. There's in each industry customers who are using 
a vanilla ERP. They are just using financials and controlling and, and so on. And then they have systems with the industry solutions. So the system we are having is from the standard, available for all industries. And for those systems that have an IS solution, they then have to wait until those have followed. So there is just a, 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 a cadence of things. But not too long. Be ensured we are really um, trying to be fast with these things. Is there a separate license for SPIN? <laughs> uh, licensing is not really my, my home turf, honestly, right? So that I would rather uh, give to the people who know about licensing. I try to get my arms, arms around technology. <laughs> don't, don't want to explain licensing in front of a camera even and so on, and I'm really not, yeah. uh, not precise <laughs> enough. I'm, I'm refraining that, uh, sorry. Uh, and about the roadmap, first you did the S-Finance, then the logistics, Yes. Etc. Okay, roadmap is the question. At the moment, we do a, a simple, or we have simple finance. Simple logistics is next, uh, but simple logistics sounds like a little bit of uh, 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 shipment and delivery, but that's not the case. It's actually inventory management, plan to produce, procure to pay, and order to cash, which is the essence of that. So that's already pretty broad, right? And then the next step will be the, the remaining components, but we've not yet laid out the sequence of that, so I don't want to suggest any, but you know there's QM, PS, enterprise asset management, those kind of things, they will follow, but we don't have a, have a, a sequence that we can communicate at the moment. Okay. We're done, okay, thanks again.